Well, welcome to a Friday Reads. I talk about what I read, what I'm reading, what I hope to get to next. I am in the middle of all the things. That's okay. But I did finish um, most of the things that I talked about last week that I hadn't already had finished. Um, and then I have also started new things. So many new things. I was trying to remember, it's like, I feel like I'm missing a book in my finished stacks. And I am. I am. It's over yonder. We'll start with that one so I don't forget. I finished Orbital. Um, having now read most of the short lit ficky things for the Ursa K. Le Guin, it's my least favorite, maybe? In Sift, both kind of have a disconnect for me. But Orbital, I think it didn't have enough direction. And I can see that, like you have people on a spaceship going about their normal day. Hypothetically, you know, you have a bunch of people, they're not going to be thinking the same thing. You're not going to have a cohesive oneness in the theme. But it just felt so surface level on so many different things. It didn't feel like an international space station to me. You don't get to know the characters, you just get to know about what they're philosophizing about on that given day. Which is a part of what makes someone a person, but it's just, it wasn't interesting to me. Um, everything I did like slowly just wore its welcome on me. I was like, I don't want another anecdote. I don't want more philosophizing on this thing. But like, that was like the good stuff. It still had all of the descriptions of Earth that never did anything for me because of how I process descriptions. They might be beautiful for someone. They just aren't for me. <laughs> so it was just a very, uh, I don't know. I think I watched a review. Um, I'll link it down below because uh, it's on the Booker long list and I have a friend on YouTube who's reading all the long lists and I was watching her review and she's like, it's a nothing book. And like, yeah, like it's not a bad book. And like, I can maybe see a universe where it really works for some people and someone thinks it's doing something novel enough to be on awards list. Just for me, like if someone gave this to me as an assignment, I'd be like, this needs to be more focused. This is not doing anything particularly well. So it was fine. I mean, I guess we'll dovetail into the last of the short like Vicky books. It lasts forever and then it's over. Um, this was really fun. This is probably my favorite. I'm trying to see if it talks about, like there's something that people hadn't been talking about this book that I didn't notice and you find out in like the first page. Let's see. Do, 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 do. So it like says undead narrator. And like, I think I assumed ghost. Um, no, zombie. <laughs> um, uh, and you find that out within like the first page. This definitely has that surrealist, absurdist, what is real quality that I kind of complain about in Sift, which I read last month. If you're curious about my thoughts, it's in the wrap up. But this one, because we started with zombie, my like scale of plausibility was much larger. Like there is, like in both books, there are scenes with people eating rocks, which is still weird that this keeps happening. Like, I don't think we make fun of literary fiction tropes enough. <laughs> like I'm just like, why are people eating rocks? What is this? This is so metaphorical. <laughs> like, it's not actually that big a deal. Um, I kind of actually get the point, but it's funny to me that it's like kind of a trick used a lot of times as a shorthand to represent X. Um, but it worked better here, that is to say, than it did in Sift for me. Just like how, you know, tropes can work better in one book than another, etc. Um, this is definitely like a lot of the short literary fiction books about grief. I think all of them touch on grief in one way or another and loss, adjustment. This one very dramatically looks at grief and I won't say that I understand all of it. I was reminded a lot of my reading experience of This Is How We Lose the Time War while reading this. Um, so that's kind of maybe a good read alike for you. I think you get less closure in this in terms of like what, why, like you don't know when the zombie apocalypse happens. This character themselves unnamed because of course unnamed protagonist in the lit fic because the name doesn't matter. Again, I, just, I joke, I joke, I do like literary fiction. It's just funny. It's just funny to me. And I make fun of genre tropes all the time too. So, uh, but we have our unnamed narrator and they can't remember themselves and they can remember their memories in their life with someone they love that they have obviously lost, but we never know their name either. Um, so it's, like I said, it's very untethered, very surreal. It has seven parts and just each part, weirder and weirder things happen. And we start with, it's a zombie thing. Like, it's not quite like Warm Bodies, that movie, if you ever saw it, where it's a little more grounded in sort of rules. No, like this is very dreamlike, very surreal. I did like it though. Um, and the writing style worked really well for me. And like, I could see myself wanting 
to reread it one day. And I say that with This Is How We Lose the Time War, which I haven't reread, but that's why I think there's just a lot of overlap of I bet I could get more out of this on a reread. I still got a lot out of it on a first read. So it's very beautiful. Um, definitely if you're looking for a unique way to process grief, loss, adjustment, adaptation, I think this is a really good one. And it reminds me of the kind of poetry book, Grief is a Thing with Feathers. Um, content wise, I wasn't reminded, but like, there is kind of a raven involved in both because how can you talk about death in a literary fiction book without a raven? It could never happen. It could never happen. Okay, so other things I have finished. I finished Tidal Creatures. Um, like I said, I liked it infinitely more than Seasonal Fears, but it doesn't come close to touching middle game. It's probably like a four-star book. Um, just a solid good time. Glad I read it. Again, if you have answers about this world, you're going to love this book if you don't mind that it's an entire info dump book with some fan service of the Roger and Dodger stuff. That's it. Um, otherwise, I don't know really what the point of it is. Like, that's the thing I think about this series. I get the point of middle game. Middle game is very clearly has a point to me. Uh, seasonal fears? I guess, yes. We're learning more about the alchemical world. We're learning how seasons come into power. But like, from a character perspective, I was just like, whatever. I don't really care about these two, like high school sweethearts. This one, there's even less though of like, a. Like, I think one of our characters, I understand her ending and like why this book is happening for her. The other one, I'm just like, is your life that different from where we started? So then maybe that's the thing, like things happen, but it feels so stagnant, like nothing really big changes. We're just existing in this adventure because if they don't do stuff, bad things will happen. Um, so it's not bad. Um, I enjoyed it. I guess cautiously, I would continue reading other installments in this world because the world is fun, but it's also just not why I loved middle game. So if I keep trying to find the middle gameness of it all, it keeps eluding me. Um, so yeah. Uh, and then the other thing that I have read since we've last talked is The Emperor and the Endless Palace. And whoa boy, this is an interesting book. I actually spent a lot of voice messages and text messages with Tammy and my friend Jocelyn, because they both read it and they both like this book a lot. And I don't dislike this book. And I don't actually think this book is failing at its internal artistic goals. But wow, do people not talk about this book appropriately a lot of the time on the internet. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, I think I was lucky enough to find the spaces on the internet that told me this is not a romance. This is not a romance. This is not a romance, okay? Now, something I don't think I was prepared for is I was prepared for tragic, a tragic love story or something like that, because I still thought love was a big element and love is, or it depends on your definition of love, but soulmate, lust, connection, love, whatever words you like, that is a big part of this book. But what I was unprepared for is that the tragedy was not external. Like the, uh, the thing that causes the tragedy to occur is actually internal and built in to the relationship, which is to say this is a very, very dark and toxic relationship you will be following. And I don't actually think people are set up to be prepared for it. Like, and I'm trying to be vague because there's a lot that this book does narratively that is meant to be surprising and I found very interesting. Like, I think it did one of my best reveals I've ever had in a long time. But there is a character in here that you follow the majority of the book. And he is, he, there's always a power divide between our two relationships. One is the emperor and one is our main character who was like a clerk. So already you always are going to have that power dynamic. That didn't like bother me initially, but even in the telling of this story, that character is physically and emotionally taken advantage of in every version of one of his lives. Um, and it's graphic and it's on page and it's non-consensual sexual assault. And it's, I think, something where I'm used to reading those sort of things, but I don't think I'm used to reading them with them being written like smut scenes which might be a thing that's more in dark romance that I don't read. I don't read that subgenre, but fantasy romance doesn't do that as much from what I can tell. So if you pick this up, know that you will be uncomfortable. And I think that's by design. Um, like I said, I don't think the author was like not realizing he made a toxic, dark, tragic love story. I think he knew what he was doing. <laughs> um, I think that us as readers haven't talked about that. So like I read and I kid you not, it's not just like one scene, the first non-consensual scene, I'm like, okay, I get what it's doing. No, it happened several times in several iterations of this person's reincarnation. And it's like, the more you think about it, the more tragic it is for this one character. Um, 
And like, that's the point. It's tragic. It's dark. It's about toxic cycles of abuse. And like, where does the cycle end? Like, that's what it's about. No one says that, but that's what it's about, thematically speaking. <laughs> um, so I think thematically, it's a really strong book. Um, from an entertainment level, um, I was kind of hoping for like a dark romantic tragedy that like was more like external factors stop the people from being together. You know, like a la Romeo and Juliet or something like that. And that's not what I got. Like, this is because of our individuals and who they are as people. And they're not even bad people, which is, I think, another strong point to the theme work is that you don't even have to be bad people to be in a toxic relationship. There doesn't have to be a bad guy, you know? And there are external bad guy forces, but like, that's really not how we get where we get. And also, I'm not quite sure if I completely understand how this all happened, but I understand enough that I'm like, whatever. But if you're someone who like wants everything tied in a bow in terms of the fantastical explanations, it's not gonna happen. Um, so I think it's like definitely, if none of those things are like huge triggers for you, like a very fascinating book to have come out. And I think, like I said, it does what it wants with intentionality. It's just, I was very uncomfortable. I, to the point where like a lot of times uh, when that character was in a scene alone with another character that wasn't the love interest, I was like, oh no, great. I am not looking forward to this. This interaction will make me uncomfy. And you know, it's just, that's not like fun, right? It's not a fun reading experience. And I kind of, if you saw my TBR, I picked this up as like my entertainment read. And uh, it, it, it ended up being a good read, but not for entertainment qualities. Okay. And now we have my stack of ongoing books. We'll start with my audio because I'm going to forget about it. And this is Mirror Dance. I haven't read it in a couple days, but it's been my audio book. And I listened to it while I was painting my window, not my window, my door sills. I guess it's called a door sill and there's a threshold above it. Regardless, the wood piece at the bottom of the door, I had to paint those. Um, so I was listening to Mirror Dance and I really like it. Shocking. Although I am curious because, so I'm at the 20% mark. And I always almost feel like I'm at the end of a traditional Miles story, but we still have so much book left. So I'm curious what's going to happen. And also what's nice about this one is this is actually like a book that has kind of followed directly the implications that were set up in Brothers in Arms, which I like. Like a lot of times things are extremely episodic. And even this, this takes place like over a year after the events of the last book. So it's not like it happened right after. But the implications of what was discovered in the previous book are being fleshed out in this one. And yeah, I mean, that, that has been happening a little bit since um, Borders of Infinity with those novellas. Everything's been a little bit more cohesively connected and less completely episodic. And I'm really liking that. Um, it kind of does feel like when you watch serialized TV, it's like, I feel like I'm in season two or three. Things are just a little bit more cohesive, less one-off-y. So that's my audiobook. I might get a lot of that read this weekend because I'm in the car for a long time. Um, and then my not for fun book, although I'm having more fun with it than anticipated, is the Siege of Burning Grass. And I don't mean I don't, I didn't pick this up saying I wouldn't have fun. It's more that I have struggled with her short stories and this is an Ursula K. Le Guin award. So it's not like I picked it out for myself. I don't really know what's happening here. I've read part one. So yeah, about this far. And this book, I believe I told you is about a person who's an extreme pacifist in this war torn world. And they are given an opportunity to help end the world by, not world, the war, by infiltrating the other side as the pacifist he is known to be. And per Premi Homo Hamid fashion, this is a very well-realized like world that you, like, and I'm almost primed for it because I had read the Library of Unbroken Worlds with its bananas world building. But here we have our main character who's having his leg regenerated and the medicine is dispensed by wasps. Okay, so that's like the type of world building you're getting here. Um, I will say that it, it feels bleak. Uh, this is a bleak world. Like literally we're at the point of a conflict where there's no food, there's no people, there's no wildlife. Um, so the atmosphere of the effects of late, this late in a war is very strong, okay? Um, but the writing style is working way better for me than any of the short stories and even the novella, which I do like, Premi Mohammed's remote novella. So I'm curious about it. I'm in part two. Uh, one downside to this book is it only has, I think, five parts and no chapters. And I do like a chapter, like I do. Um, but this is working better for me than I anticipated. I just haven't been in like the biggest reading headspace. I literally just like spent an hour yesterday upgrading my gear in Horizon. Like that's the type of headspace I'm in. 
And then my like fun, I'm pretty sure this is just like a good reading time book is The Seventh Bride by T. King Fisher. I'm pretty early on. What's really interesting. So I believe this came out the same year as Uprooted and also Akatar. The, the 2015 was a time for like Beauty and the Beast retellings. And I'm not saying this is a Beauty and the Beast retelling. Um, T. King Fisher already has one of those. That's called Byrony and Roses. But the part of the Beauty and the Beast retelling that was very popular is girl must leave home to be with guy she doesn't really want to be with <laughs> for X recent. Um, and that happened in Uprooted, A Court of Thorns and Roses, and this all 2015. Now, this is the one no one talked about because it was independently pressed, I like, published, I believe, and things like that. Um, but I really like Rhea. She's a classic T. King Fisher protagonist. Lots of discussions on swans so far and how evil they are <laughs> and her vendetta against the swan. Um, she's really good at problem solving and thinking, and it really shows, I don't know, just how, like, her family loves her. Like, this isn't a fairy tale retelling where her family doesn't love her, but they're just shit out of luck. Like, she has to get married. There's no money. There's no food. Um, and you don't say no to a nobleman. So I, I want to get further into this. I'm really only 45 pages in. I just uh, instead, when I had insomnia last night, watched The Great, which um, I've only watched one episode. I'm interested. I'm very interested. So those are the things that I've been reading. I would love to have finished one or two of those things before I check in next week, but I have a pretty busy weekend ahead of me and I need to start prepping my online class, which means I'll be spending more time filming and less time putzing about. <laughs> So uh, the only other thing I would love to pick up and I have the ebook. So for when I go on my trip, you know, I have access to it. And that's Lost Places by Sarah Pinsker. Um, I just haven't read any of it yet. So I, I should get to that. And also, I haven't read a lot of sci fi this month. If last month was the month of sci fi, I don't know what this month is, but I haven't read as much sci fi. So that would also I think be a good insert of that energy there. So what are you reading, doing, watching? Have you watched The Great? The Great is like, it is really absurd, but like I'm vibing with it. I think the act, I mean, I like the um, actor who's playing Emperor Peter. Um, I just really like him. Like I had avoided watching the show because I didn't know its vibe. And like my friend did tell me the name of the actor. But the problem is, is like, I don't know actor names. I just know person that was in blah, 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 <laughs> which is, you know, not, not my best trait, but it's a thing. It's who I am. And so then I was watching a clip someone shared. And I didn't even know it was from the great. I was like, oh, this looks good. And then, and it was like, oh, that's a guy from the menu in X-Men First Class. And I was just like, you didn't tell me it was that. I'm going to start watching it now to my friend who's been recommending me the show. She's like, I told you it was blah, blah, blah. And it's like, I don't know people. <laughs> like, what do you want from me? You have to be like a big superhero. And like, I know he was in X-Men First Class, but like, that's not the same as like being like Chris Evans or something. Like, that's not the same. I think his name's Nicholas Holt. I think I now know his name but I didn't know for a while. And he's really good <laughs> as Emperor Peter. And I don't know the actress that's playing Catherine, Empress Catherine, and she's really good too. Um, the way she can flip from like ditzy, like over the top romantic to like, oh, I'm coming for you. Like that flip, she's really good. So that's also going to be an impediment to my reading progress between that and wanting to update my gear in Horizon and needing to prepare for work. But I'm generally having a good time. Uh, so I'm just gonna lean into that energy. <laughs> Uh, if you just want to leave an emoji to let me know you're here, leave me a raven because I think also this is a raven. It's because again, death. Poor ravens. Like, are they like, do they come by this definition? Honestly, bird people. Do ravens like, are they the type of bird that eat more carrion than other birds? Like, why are they the symbol of death? Is it just Edgar Allan Poe? Is it just him? I mean, I love Edgar Allan Poe, but like, ravens are really nice. Like, I don't know why be, uh, being associated with death all the time feels like it's a harsh gig. I don't know. Anyways, like if you liked it, subscribe if you want to, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.